Well, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, it's a bit of an unusual topic tonight. We're going to look more into history than um, we would normally do in scientific or theological issues. Um, uh, as you know, we're here in Dayton, Tennessee, home of the world-famous Scopes trial. And uh, you might not know quite how crazy the 1920s were back then when people were doing uh, a lot of writing about evolution. Um, the time period, this is prior to what um, scientists call the, the emergence of the, the neo-Darwinian synthesis, which was the thing that came around in the 30s that sort of convinced a lot of scientists that Darwin's ideas about natural selection were probably right. And so this period of time, people were still arguing, scientists were still arguing a lot about um, how evolution might have taken place. So there were plenty of people who accepted that evolution happened, but they didn't accept how it happened. So they argued about Lamarckism, they argued about all sorts of strange things. Um, so I have here on the cart here a whole stack of, I just went through our collection over here and grabbed out a nice little stack of books that were published in the 20s, uh, one in 1931, uh, all about why evolution is wrong. Um, and they are written by any number of people with any number of qualifications. Some of these people are theologians, some of them are journalists, some of them are scientists, some are engineers, um, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are many more of these things uh, in other collections. Probably the most famous one I have here, you might have seen that famous photograph from the Scopes trial, T.T. Martin's uh, book table where he was selling Hell in the High Schools. This is Hell in the High Schools. Uh, Christ or evolution, which? So there's a famous picture of that big banner and everybody's crowded around looking at his books. This is what he was selling. It isn't very good. <laughs> I've read it. Um, it reads more like, uh, I mean, it's not even very good by the standards of the day. So if you ever want to check that out, you can go ahead and look at what we've got here in the collection. But what we want to talk about tonight is this weird thing right here, the so-called Triassic shoe fossil. This is about as good as you'll get in terms of the original, the original photography of the actual specimen. Um, the rock itself is long gone, uh, and by some grace or favor of God, we came to acquire uh, the scrapbook kept by this guy, John Reed, who was promoting this thing during the 1920s. So this is what it looks like. And you can see here, it does vaguely kind of look like a shoe. You could imagine this is where the, the side of the shoe came up and this is the actual sole of the shoe. This is what uh, Reed believed. These photographs are from a book called uh, uh, God or Gorilla. It was written by Alfred Watterson McCann. McCann was a uh, journalist mostly. He wrote newspaper columns and eventually had his own radio show. Uh, and McCann was a crusader for pure foods. He is very much, as far as I can tell from my reading, he was really in, uh, involved in developing food handling laws in the country by promoting safe food uh, uh, preparation and safe food transport and sale, all of that stuff. This is what he was mostly known for. He did write this one book about why evolution is bogus. It was published in 1922 two or three, um, it was called God or Gorilla. Uh, and that is where he highlights this fossil or this rock. He says here, note stitches remarkably preserved along outer edge of welt, particularly so on upper left hand margin and lower margin a little to left of center. Um, 
and then he, sh uh, this is the only place I know of that has a photograph of the back side of the rock as well as the front side. So other than this, this thing is not very well known. It's, it's found in a few things. This, this book here called Forbidden Archaeology, it's in the back here somewhere. Well, anyway, Forbidden Archaeology uh, still has a picture of this poorly reproduced, probably from McCann. And, uh, but otherwise, you don't hear too much about this, this oddity today. So here's what McCann wrote about it. The sole of the shoe is so obviously the sole of a shoe with its beveled welt and hand-stitched seams that no observer can doubt for an instant either its origin or nature. And this is the guy who brought it to New York. This is John Reed. Uh, he uh, was a mining engineer from Nevada. And uh, he was apparently known as a friend of the Native Americans. He could speak Paiute, uh, which is interesting. As far as I can tell from the notebook that we have, the scrapbook here, and from my other reading about him, he doesn't seem to be particularly religious. So many of the individuals in this stack right here are highly motivated by their religious commitments, the Christian faith. Um, but McCann seemed to be just sort of a gadfly. He just liked tweaking the evolutionists, and that's really what motivated him, as far as I can tell. Uh, he did not find this rock. He found it, he acquired it from a Nevada miner named Alfred Knapp. And this was prior to 1922. So this is the actual notebook right here. This is or what's left of the notebook. It's long since disintegrated. Uh, the box we keep it in has lots of little scraps of paper um, where it's come apart. Uh, it's just labeled newspaper clippings pertaining to the Triassic shoe fossil uh, and property of John Reed, Lovelock, Nevada. Nevada. Uh, and most of the pages are loose. You can see there's lots of just little clippings here. Uh, in the book, I have read through the whole thing and I have he does have a couple of places where he has some notes but mostly it's just clippings and correspondence related to uh, his rock uh, and this thing gives us really I think a fascinating glimpse into the world of 1920s era pre-scopes trial just by a few years anti-evolution stuff, right? So uh, this is the earliest uh, article from the, the notebook here. Uh, Elko is a town on sort of, sort of, so Lovelock is sort of on the northern half of Nevada. It's kind of towards the west. Elko is more on the northern half of Nevada towards the east. And this article indicates that he was traveling through with this rock on his way, it says here, to Washington, D.C. to present it to the National Museum. Uh, and it describes it as a well-preserved imprint of the right shoe of a human foot in rock, uh, the formation of which extends back to five million years. It was found in Pershing County, a little south of Lovelock. So this is our first hint of, you know, this is, he had it before 1922, however he got it. Uh, I, as far as I can tell, I don't know that he made it to Washington, D.C. Where he did spend time was New York City. And he made it to the American Museum of Natural History there in New York. This particular article is from the New York Times discussing how he came to town and presented it at the uh, American Museum and tried to get the paleontologists there interested in his shoe fossil. Uh, and you can see <laughs> the headline right here. They call it Nature Fake. Um, so, yeah, you can guess how the museum guys reacted to it. Uh, this letter here describes in pretty good detail uh, 
his meeting at the, uh, in his interactions with the American Museum, says, I was in New York, so this was written in 1924, he's recalling his meeting in 1922. I was in New York in the early part of 1922, called upon Dr. Matthews of the American Museum of Natural History and brought with me the Triassic Soul fossil. After showing him another specimen that I had, I called his attention to this shoe sole and to ask him what he thought of it. He expressed his great surprise and astonishment at anything that resembled a shoe sole so much as this in every particular. But, he said, Mr. Reed, it cannot be a shoe sole because man was not existence in the Triassic time. If it was a fossil found in the rock of the Pleistocene, we should be interested in it. However, we should like to purchase it from you just to show to the public how nature mimics the handiwork of man in almost every particular. I had gone to the museum with the intention of giving this fossil to them, but when I saw that Dr. Matthews was indisposed to accept it for that which I was sure from its appearance it was, and to give it its proper place in the museum, I declined to consider his offer of purchase. The whole incident led me to the conclusion that his mind was biased by his own theories as to the origin and place of man on the earth, and that I would not be doing justice to the fossil itself by turning it over to Dr. Matthews or to the institution he represented. Later, at the insistence of some friends downtown, the director of the museum had his attention called to this fossil, and he referred it for investigation to his mineralogist. In a day or so thereafter, I received a communication from the mineralogist, I believe his name was Whitlock, requesting me to call at the museum and saying that he would tell me what it was that I had. I went to the museum with the fossil, and when he had viewed it, Professor Whitlock pronounced it a concretion, with some of the contained minerals breaking down, forming a color simulating leather, whereas Dr. Matthews pronounced it a true fossil. In view of these two statements not being in harmony, and in fact in conflict, the lack <coughs> of wisdom in reaching a hasty conclusion was all the more apparent to me, and I considered it unwise to accept the views of either as being specific. So, so he gets to the museum, he shows his rock, gets in to see this paleontologist who is not interested in it at all. He thinks it's just a rock. Uh, the next guy he sees is the mineralogist. I think the mineralogist nailed it. I think it's a concretion, as far as I can tell from the photographs. But we'll talk more about that here momentarily. They do seem to be exactly what I would expect from a concretion. All right, so at this time then, he somehow makes connect connections with Alfred McCann. This is uh, when McCann was uh, a, uh, a regular columnist for the New York, New York Globe, the Globe and Commercial Advertiser, uh, and he begins to promote uh, this thing as a challenge to evolution. McCann was, uh, by all accounts that I can find, um, pretty accustomed to challenging the common wisdom, right? So people who were selling food and transporting food didn't really like him. He apparently had been arrested for libel. I didn't even know you could get arrested for libel. And, uh, but he'd never been actually convicted for libel. So McCann was quite accustomed to just flat out uh, waving in the face of people he didn't agree with. So it sort of makes sense that he would uh, pick up on this evolution idea as well. So he has a number of little uh, idea, um, there's a number of little headlines here uh, relating to things about evolution. But the main headline being science all upset over piece of Triassic rock. Uh, and then he's got another one, is age of Triassic shoe, 20 million years. Uh, and then uh, again, imprint of Triassic shoe may change method of estimating world's age. So um, Can has a uh, runs a whole series of articles and then ends up uh, with the clearest photographs of the rock uh, published in his book. Also, while he, uh, Reed was in New York at that time, and this is widely attested in all the sources that talk about this, he went to something called the Rockefeller Institute and had micrographs made of the rock. Um, and these allegedly show very clearly the stitching 
and fine detail of the shoe. Now I've looked at plenty of fossils under the microscope. I know when you do that, the detail just pops out. You can't mistake it for anything else. And I was quite delighted to find that the nine original micrographs are actually in the scrapbook right here in my hand. I have never displayed these publicly. I've been sort of reticent to do so. Um, but hey, let's go and have a look at them now, shall we? I'll just pass these around. They're pretty sturdy. I don't think you can hurt them. Um, I will point out a few things. Here, here's what they look like. Just for the sake of the camera, we'll get some close-ups later. This is not what I see for fossils. When I look at a fossil under the microscope, I see microscopic fossil stuff, right? The minerals, the minerals replace the fine, fine, fine biological details of the fossil. This looks like a rock. It really does look like a rock. So these guys, you know, we, we zoomed in on the, um, on the stuff that's supposed to be stitching. And I'm looking at it going, I don't see anything here that, I mean, I can see why you would think holding it far away, it looks a little bit like stitching, but it doesn't look like stitching under the microscope. Uh, and then this page here, I'm gonna leave this up here, if you can look at it later if you want. Um, this page shows a key to uh, where each one of these images came from. So if you wanted to sort of orient it onto the actual rock, you could figure that out. But these are the original micrographs. There you go. Try not to damage them. Don't sneeze on them or anything. <laughs> All right. So yeah. So interesting stuff. Next we have here, it gets picked up in a magazine called The Gathering Call in July of 1923. Uh, in this article called um, A Troubler in the Camp of Scientists. The Gathering Call was published by a guy named E.S. Ballinger. Ballinger was pretty well known, and The Gathering Call was pretty well known, as a, a magazine that was basically anti-Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, these guys who published it were highly critical of the Seventh-day Adventist church, and especially of their um, special Adventist doctrines. Um, and so they published this magazine regularly, but apparently they were still Christians and they still published things that were of interest to people other than just why Seventh-day Adventists are wrong. So that's kind of nice. Um, and then we see here they have, they got a picture of the rock as well as a nice little article here and uh, it's, in a, it's in an envelope in the, in the scrapbook here, marked as the gathering call, a religious paper uh, of Riverside, California. So again, I'm sort of guessing here that he, Reed is not particularly in this because he wants to support creation. He's just sort of enjoying uh, confronting evolutionists with this weird rock. Um, this particular article I'm suspecting is along with McCann's book how it gets promoted among the creationists who later pick it up in the 60s, the 50s and 60s and spread it from there. Um, the editor who picked up this paper after Ballinger was a guy named Donald Moat. And the uh, antique dealer that I bought the notebook from uh, he had acquired the notebook at the estate sale of Donald Moat. So that's how I sort of connected all the dots. This is where it came from. I'm guessing that um, Reed later in life passed it on to Ballinger and Ballinger then uh, maybe he passed it on to Moat, I'm not sure. I know that um, the papers from the gathering call and from Ballinger were acquired by the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church, ironically, uh, and they're on deposit at the Center for Adventist Research in Andrews University in uh, Southern Michigan. I've been there. Um, and uh, 
apparently they didn't want the notebook or they didn't know about the notebook. I don't know how it escaped their acquisition. So I'm guessing it either wasn't in the office or it wasn't something they wanted. Um, but now we have it, so now I can tell the story. Uh, he did continue to try to promote this uh, discovery in 1923. This is, as you can see, a lovely thank you card from the American Museum of Natural History. They refused to pay him what he felt was appropriate for what he thoroughly believed was a shoe fossil. And so instead, he sent them a photograph. So this uh, reads, the American Museum of Natural History has received from Mr. John T. Reed one photograph of fossil, quote, Triassic shoe sole, quote, and gratefully acknowledges th this contribution to its collections. It's got this lovely stamp there as well, so that's kind of nice. This is dated March 5th, 1923, so it's almost exactly a year after uh, he was there and couldn't convince anybody, so he sent them a photograph. Uh, he also sent a photograph to the British Museum. They were less inclined to agree with him than the American Museum. The American Museum acknowledged that it was a photograph of a whatever shoe, shoe fossil. Uh, the British Museum here, I am directed to return to you thanks of the trustees of the British Museum for your present of the following photograph of a specimen of rock from Nevada which has been received and deposited in the library. So they weren't even going to call it uh, Triassic shoe sole fossil. They just said it's a photograph of a rock. Nice. Um, also in the 20s, another fellow, this guy right here, that is a man named John Roach Stratton. Uh, he was pastor of Calvary Baptist Church. Uh, Calvary Baptist was uh, on 57th Street in New York City, uh, and he uh, famously got into a big tussle, a big argument with the American Museum of Natural History. The American Museum had just debuted a new evolution exhibit, and uh, Stratton had uh, toured it and found it highly objectionable, as you might imagine. Brian, William James Bryan, is already stirring up the pot there with his uh, crusade. And so Stratton goes after the American Museum and an exchange of letters. I don't know that it was an exchange, but it was a number of letters that were published in the New York Times, as well as um, uh, what was a written debate. <laughs> and, and this is delightful. He published the written debate. He debated some other individual, but the other individual refused to consent to publication. So the debate is only entirely one-sided. It's only Stratton's uh, arguments. <laughs> and it's published in this book uh, by John Rhodes Stratton. Anyway, it's an interesting character. So, so here he is, uh, and he is having a series of meetings about evolution. Uh, and why is this here? Uh, this is uh, for Sunday, March 16th, 1924. Uh, the bulletin for that evening, and inside of the bulletin, we find, uh, marked right there, the evening worship with sermon by the pastor on Christ the greatest scientist and teacher. In a current topic talk before the regular sermon, Dr. Stratton will raise the question, as a friend and not a foe of the American Museum of Natural History, whether the minds of the scientists are really open to new truth. He will show stereopticon pictures of some of the exhibits of the museum and point out certain contradictory statements made by the scientists themselves in connection with them. It is expected that a well-known geologist and mineralogist will be present and will present facts and exhibit fossils disproving the theories of evolution. Mm, I'm guessing that's Reed. I, I don't know why else he would have that there. Um, uh, so he was um, <clears throat> apparently invited uh, to Calvary Baptist Church by Stratton to present uh, his fossil evidence. At the time, he also was uh, bringing around what he called a carbonized uh, horse hoof uh, that he had found that was supposed to be Cretaceous, uh, that had all the anatomical details correct. And then uh, this final... Uh, 
letter here, this is uh, 1926, uh, where Reed is uh, talking about these uh, fossils that he has accumulated. He's apparently anti-evolution fossils. I've, I've been wondering for the past few years where I was finally going to put these fossils that I have here, that they might have proper recognition before the world and not be relegated to the rear. And uh, do you know, as I mentioned to Dr. Somebody at the Rockefeller Institute, I do not know of a museum in the United States that really welcomes any evidence against evolution. This is a strange situation, but nevertheless it is so. And I am thinking that it will be essential that some independent place be established for receiving just such specimens, of which I think there are many that would be coming forward from many quarters to add to those now known. He also got this letter from a guy named Siegfried in Montana, Bear Creek, Montana, with a photograph of a lovely fossilized tooth that he thinks is strange and out of place, another one of these specimens. So he continued, this shoe fossil wasn't the only thing he was collecting, he was collecting all sorts of these odd fossils. So what is it? It's probably a concretion. Um, I've shown it to a lot of uh, my geologist friends and colleagues and they say, yeah, that, that's, that's just a rock. There's lots of them like that. I talked to uh, one geologist uh, from Cedarville University who told me about this guy who just kept sending him these weird shaped rocks that were supposedly fossilized hats and fossilized cats and fossilized this and that. And yeah, you know, rocks have weird shapes and especially concretions like this. And so uh, I don't see anything here that would make me think that that is an actual shoe fossil. But I don't want to leave you thinking that all of creationism is crazy because we're not. Um, things have changed a lot. I don't know that I would ever describe um, Reed as an actual creationist. He was, as I said, uh, he liked to cause trouble and he liked to tweak the noses of, of the scientists of the day. But the world of the 1920s is not the world that we occupy today. And uh, the sort of knockdown, drag out kind of evolutionary battles that were going on then, it's very different. Uh, very different world today. And we have a lot more people doing a lot of serious uh, paleontology. So for example, here in the Grand Canyon, this, this whitish layer of rock that you can see there, that's called the Coconino Sandstone. And it's the site of uh, research. If you've read my book, The Quest, I talk about Dr. Brand's research out there on the Coconino sandstone, uh, the footprints that are preserved there, those are a type of fossil. Uh, and that work has been published in conventional geology journals, not just in the creationist literature. So creationism has come a long, a long way. Uh, another example of some of the research, petrified forest. So the um, petrified forests in Yellowstone uh, my wife and I climbed up to Specimen Ridge a couple of years ago. Almost killed us getting there, but we got there. It's very steep. Uh, and um, this, these uh, trees that are found there are um, the subject of uh, Harold Coffin's research. Uh, he and his colleagues have been studying these trees for many years, uh, trying to understand how they came to be there. Did they grow there or something else? What you find when you get up there is this is what the layer of uh, rock looks like that these trees are lodged in. It's, it's huge, gigantic debris flow, um, and it's volcanic. Uh, so it looks as though, theoretically, many of these uh, trees were logs that were washed in. Even some of the upright stumps may have been washed in. Um, another example from my own work, uh, I'm really quite interested in studying uh, the hominins, the so-called ape men, and trying to understand, you know, should we understand them from an evolutionary perspective, like on the left here, or is it better to understand a particular unique cluster that contains uh, what we would understand as humanity? And final example here uh, is an ongoing uh, excavation of dinosaurs. 
uh, organized out of um, Southwestern Adventist University and the Earth Science, uh, sorry, the Earth History Research Center. Uh, they go every summer in the month of June. They spend about four weeks there digging dinosaurs. They've pulled out over 20,000 dinosaur bones. They map them. So this image right here, this is so cool. They have a surveyor's GPS unit that can place an object within just millimeters of where it's located, right? It's like this huge, massive thing, and you have to set up this big tripod, and then you have a backpack unit, and then it relates to the tripod, and so it can really uh, triangulate precisely where things are. So when they find a bone in this, in this excavation, they can put various uh, GPS points on the bone. Once it's excavated and cleaned, then they photograph it, and then they can use the computer to replace digitally, take, so you cut out the little bone picture, and you can place it into the quarry. So this image here is not just uh, a diagram of what the quarry might look like. This is highly detailed, highly accurate mapping of every bone that's been found at the, at the time from that particular dinosaur quarry. It is remarkable work, and it's been published widely and, and presented at um, geological conferences as well. And if you have interest in digging up dinosaurs, well, you should check out their website at dinosaurproject.swau.edu. And that is that. It's easy, simple, short talk tonight. Uh, kind of a fun little trip back in time to the 20s and the craziness of the uh, Scopes era and the Roaring Twenties. Hey, thanks for watching my video lecture. If you liked that, do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. If you didn't like it, do me a favor and post your outrage on social media so that other people will see it and maybe they'll hit the subscribe button. Uh, check us out on Facebook, uh, Twitter. Uh, you can find our website, Core Academy is at corsi.org. My own blog is toddcwood.blogspot.com. Thanks for watching.